We, oh, good to know. <laughs> we proudly represent a movement of 1.2 million gender justice advocates nationwide. And we're so glad to be able to spend a little bit of time with you today uh, talking about where we're at, what is ahead, and our collective fight to build a feminist, inclusive, anti-racist future. We are truly humbled to be in this work with you. First, a few logistics. Today's town hall will be one hour. We will be recording today's event for those who are not able to attend. So now is a good time to turn off your video if you do not want your image captured. We'll also be utilizing automated captions for anybody who would benefit. We also hope that you feel free to engage with one another in the chat. Let us know what brought you here today and where you're joining us from. Uh, I'm joining from Washington, DC. We'll also be wrapping up this town hall with a Q&A session using the chat functionality for questions. I'm so, so excited to be connecting with all of you tonight because it is a big moment. There are only 35 days left until the election. And we know that people are righteously angry, but also motivated to engage, lean in and vote. We're a little more than four weeks away from, from what will be a critical election. And we're excited to share with you some of our plans tonight. With that, I am so excited to kick it over to our executive director, Shana Thomas, to kick us off and tell us a bit more about where we are and where we're going. Hi, everybody. I'm Shauna Thomas. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Ultraviolet. I'm so thrilled to be with you tonight. Really grateful to be in community with you at this really crucial moment. Together tonight, um, we're going to talk about holding misogynist politicians accountable and the corporations that support their mission to undermine our freedoms. And we're gonna talk about what we're doing to build the power to get what we need to thrive, including uh, ahead of this election, getting out the vote. You know, I want, I do wanna kick us off with some grounding in this moment. You know, we at Ultraviolet, we really see this midterm in the election, and this midterm election, excuse me, and the months ahead as a turning point, you know, in how we organize and how we build a long-term vision um, and how we build power. Women, gender non-conforming people across race and place are at the forefront of the cultural and political revolution we need to win, to win all the rights and freedoms we deserve. We can't mince words in this moment. Republicans have successfully subverted democracy to overturn Roe, and it was a shock to this country's system. It's put millions of people's lives in the crosshairs, and it's a pretty blaring indicator light you know, for the dangerous path that we're on. Our basic freedoms are absolutely in trouble. And also the fall of Roe is the beginning of a new fight. It's not the end. Before Roe fell, a lot of people just didn't believe the Supreme Court would, would go this far you know, to overturn over 50 years of precedent. And for the first time in history, take a hard earned right away, the right to control our own bodies, right? It's a, it's a white supremacist patriarchal power play that we do not accept and we cannot accept. Public support for the Supreme Court has plummeted and their and their legitimacy is in question, you know, where abortion has been on the ballot already, including in places where Republicans are in charge, like in Kansas, they are losing, right? And they're being confronted with the truth that the majority opposes their extremist position. The women are registering in huge numbers because they refuse to accept second class status. And that means we have a major opportunity to begin the long-term work of organizing and co-creating with you all, our partners and our communities to really reimagine you know, the institutions and the culture and the politics that we need to win. Fundamentally, I think what's on the line this election and really in every local state and federal election going forward, it's not just democracy, but freedom, right? The freedom to decide how, when, or if we decide to expand our families, the freedom to live in safe and thriving communities, the freedom to love who we love, the freedom to vote and have that vote be counted, right? the freedom to access a safe internet and accurate information online. And we know the future we want, we're laying the foundation now to fight for it. We've identified some pretty key barriers we know we need to address to ensure we have the power necessary to guarantee those freedoms. These are the barriers we can overcome and turn to our advantage if we work together at it, right? It's And those are, we'll start with one, it's corporate complicity and support for and their support, corporate support for anti-democracy, anti-abortion politicians and political groups. The second is the right wing's disinformation warfare and the social media platforms that are profiting from that hate and violence. And the third is the politicians themselves, the ones working against us, who we need to hold accountable and the ones who are working for us, who we need to support. So, you know, we know 
I think collectively, and we're excited to hear from you on this, you know, um, is the policies and politics that we need and will demand from our for our leaders. As a baseline, we demand an economy that is working for us. We demand investments in care, child care, elder care, family care, and the workers who make that care possible. We're demanding universal inclusive paid leave. We're demanding abortion access for everyone who needs it without restriction, without apology, and we need universal health care. We're demanding climate policy that works for all, including frontline black, brown, and indigenous women in communities. We're demanding a living wage, quality housing, safe working conditions, and safe communities for everybody. So this is obviously not, it's not the work of one election cycle or one Congress, but it's the work of our generation and the generations after us to protect and expand. But we are mobilizing for this election, but we're looking forward 10, 20, 30 years from now to see the world we deserve and how we're gonna get there. It's challenging, but it also can be rewarding. It can even be joyful, right? There are, certainly there are crosswinds, they're economic, there's wars, there's still a pandemic, but I am hopeful. I'm hopeful because I believe in our community. I believe in our power. And I know that we represent the majority of Americans who want a better future for themselves and their families, really a future centered in gender justice. I'm very excited for you to hear from our amazing staff on the work we're doing going into the midterms and how, uh, we can all work together to protect abortion at the ballot box, elect gender justice champions and fighters, fight back against corporate money, and make the internet a more safe place for all of us in our, in our democracy. So now I'd like to invite Sonia Spu, Ultraviolet's Political Director and Director of Government, Government Affairs and Advocacy, to talk about the work you all can plug into ahead of the election on November 8th. Thank you, Shauna, and thank you again to everyone for joining us this evening. Again, my name is Sonia, and I'm the political director at Ultraviolet, and I am also based in D.C., which has been rainy for four days straight, so I'm looking forward to sun. Um, Ultraviolet has been doing a great deal of visioning and thinking about how we want to broaden and deepen our political work as we face this critical juncture in our nation's history. Um, as Shauna just said, this is a moment for a major shift, and we know that the majority and the momentum is on our side. Um, Shauna referenced Kansas, and I know I don't know about you all, but after what happened with both the leak of the Supreme Court decision and then the ultimate decision on abortion rights in the fall of Roe with the Dobbs case, um, I felt a huge amount of hope coming out of the Kansas abortion referendum fight in August. Um, and showing that really showed what we always know, which is that abortion wins and that there's no such thing as, an, as a state that is unwinnable on this issue without, as long as we are organizing deeply, organizing honestly, and speaking to people where they're at. Um, we know that abortion is a winning, is a winning, is a pathway to victory for us politically because people fundamentally care about their rights and no one likes to be told they can't they or their loved ones cannot get the care they need when they need it. So this is the thing that will change the political calculus and upend the business as usual expectations that we sometimes see dominate the media about what does and does not move voters and what does and does not motivate people. Because we know that women are voting in huge, huge numbers and coming out and registering huge numbers. Um, so I'm excited to share an overview of what we're going to be going through with our programming tonight, and then talk a little bit about our PAC program that we just started. Um, so you'll hear about ways through our PAC program to support gender justice champions and challengers. These are the challengers and the fighters that we need to upend um, the business as usual status quo in DC and around the country, and to support a gender justice future. We are activating members online and offline to get out the vote for abortion freedom. We are holding corporations accountable for the anti-abortion political contributions, and we are fighting a, abortion and candidate misinformation and disinformation online to make a better, more accurate internet. I am super excited to talk about the ways in which we have started a new program, our PAC program, which is focused on supporting the gender justice challengers and fighters that we need in this moment. Our PAC program, which we launched in July of this year, um, is really about working to highlight and support leaders who are willing to name, to claim, and to fight for an anti-racist feminist future. This sometimes means being willing to ruffle feathers, toss out process that impedes progress, and challenge the status quo. If I can have the slide switched, actually. Um, 
as I mentioned in late July, we launched our slate, our first slate of endorsements, which was called our Challenger Slates. This is a slate of progressive champions who are leading the way on disrupting the status quo. This includes people like the incredible Stacey Abrams, who's running for governor in, in um, Georgia. It includes Mandela Barnes, who is running for US Senate in Wisconsin, and um, Maxwell Frost, who won his primary and will likely therefore win his seat and will be the first Gen Z um, candidate from our Gen Z House, US House rep um, coming from the state of Florida and overall as well, which is a big generational moment. Next week, be on the lookout on social media and in your email, we'll be revealing our fighter slate. These are endorsements focused on the critical incumbents that we need to keep in office to protect abortion freedom at the state level and to expand and protect it at the federal level. We know, as, as many of you know, Sometimes the difference between having access to abortion or not is the difference between a veto in the governor's mansion. In states like Michigan or Pennsylvania, that is the only thing keeping back abortion bans from being implemented in these states. It's critical that we keep that veto power as we also work down ballot to expand a pro-abortion, pro-freedom, pro-gender justice majority in all the states across the country. We are also kicking into high gear, new work in the states focusing on offline activations this weekend. We hope you will join us um, in our partnership with Women's March and other partners around the country um, to yet again flood the streets um, and lift our voices up for the Women's Wave of Action, which is a series of over 300 marches and rallies planned across the country this weekend to remind those in power that again, we are voting, we are out to protect our rights and to show the political power of this pro-abortion majority that has been mobilizing and is going to continue to mobilize around the country. So our ask for you is that you register to attend one of these actions and bring five friends with you. And then let us know how it goes. Tag us on social media, um, send us pictures on social media. We'd love to see folks attend rallies or send us your you know, photos of your amazing posters and stuff. Um, and we'll just help lift that up and show again, just this full work of support that we've been building since the Dobbs leak and going forward. I'm gonna drop the link in the chat for you to register. And I'm gonna pass the mic on over now to my incredible colleague, Elisa, to talk about another action you can take with us. Just had to, uh, yep, yeah, I think I'm unmuted now. Yes, we can hear you. Hi, UV fam. Um, it's great to be here in community with you all. I am a the content director of Ultraviolet. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm based in Berkeley, California. So I am excited to share with you um, a postcard writing campaign that we just introduced with our partners at Moms Rising. Um, Moms Rising has made it very easy for you all to reach out to swing voters. Um, by providing prepaid postcards and sample language. Um, you don't need to be a mom to participate, just passionate about getting out the vote. Um, to participate in this Get Out the Vote program, I'll drop the link in the chat and then follow up with you all on email. Um, you can sign up to receive prepaid postcards in batches of 20 or 100. So I want to emphasize that mailing postcards is a proven tactic to get out the vote. Based on the outcomes of the 2020 presidential and Georgia senatorial races, voter turnout increased by as much as 3%, handing the presidency and both Georgia Senate seats to the Democrats. Sending postcards to voters in swing states this election cycle could make a huge difference in closely contested races across the country. Um, th the best parts about writing these postcards is that it's fun, it can be done on your own time, and you can do it with loved ones. If you sign up for the packets of 100, you can invite friends over and make it a social event. Um, the postcards will be mailed out to you after October 14th, and then the goal is to get them out to voters on October 21st so that they arrive before Election Day. We're able to track the postcards through share mail to see that they're delivered to voters, and last year, Moms Rising saw a completion rate of over 90%. 
we're hoping to hit that number again this year. And we're hoping that you'll be able to help us meet our own personal goals here at UV to um, get in touch with 150,000 voters. That comes out to between 1,500 and 2,000 of our members. I know we've got this. We can do this. Thank you so much for being a part of our community. And now I will pass it on to Kathy. Thanks, Alisa. Super excited for the postcard program this year. I have also requested mine. Um, and I'm Kathy Plate, Managing Director of Growth and Member Experience at Ultraviolet. And I just wanted to share about another exciting new program we're offering to reach voters this year, which is new to us, uh, which is virtual text banks. Starting next Tuesday, we're gonna be doing virtual text banks every Tuesday, we're calling it Texting Tuesdays, <laughs> up until the election, um, in order to first uh, recruit additional volunteers to help us mobilize this election season. And then we'll be working to turn out voters in key states to help protect our freedoms, including the right to abortion at the ballot box. We have a goal of sending over half a million texts to voters, and we're gonna need your help to reach everyone during this critical time where we know that turnout can make a huge difference during midterms. And one of the things I really like um, about text banks is both that we're able to use really great data on the voters that we're able to reach by linking it to the voter file. We can tell folks who've already turned in, who haven't, who are lower or higher propensity voters. Um, and so we're able to be really strategic with it. It's also really fun. Unlike doing phone banks where you're all on the phone at the same time and can't really talk to each other, um, we're able to hang out and socialize while we're sending text messages and also hear from each other about how it's going. Um, so I want to do a pause real quick and just see in chat um, if folks want to uh, put either yes or no if you have done a text bank to voters before, just so I can get a general sense of folks' experience. And I'll just hold on for a second while people reply and share in. continue to reply, but I'm getting in a totally non-scientific, I'm seeing both yes and no. <laughs> so I just want to name um, that whether you have done it before or not, uh, I want to reassure you that we'll start with intros, we'll get to know each other before we get into texting, we'll do a training on the program, sometimes it's a little bit different uh, depending on who you um, worked with in the past um, so that everyone gets step-by-step -step instructions and feels really comfortable about being able to text voters, um, especially because the peer-to-peer -peer texting of feeling like you're actually talking to a real person has a significant impact on get out the vote. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll be reaching out to voters we've matched on the voter file and are really critical to turnout. So we'll be online the whole time and able to help guide if you have questions, if you have any issues, um, we'll be able to walk you through the whole thing. Um, and like I said, I really think it can be a fun experience. If folks aren't in a chatting mood, we'll have music kind of like we had at the beginning of today. Um, and if, um, if we're in a mood to chat or we're getting interesting responses from folks, we can kind of talk about that while we're on Zoom texting voters together. I know I was able to participate in some text banks with our partner orgs in the past and really had some fun with it. Um, and it feels like you're able, you know, I don't know for folks who've gone out and canvassed, it's both great to canvass and like it takes a long time to hit, you know, a hundred doors, whereas sending a hundred texts takes virtually no time at all. Um, and so if you're interested in joining, I'm gonna put a, a link in the chat for you to sign up to join the Texting Tuesdays. We'll also be following up on email with lots more information for how you can get involved. And if texting isn't for you, there's postcards, there's canvassing, there's lots of other things that you can do. And I'm gonna go ahead and pass the mic over to my colleague, Sonia, to talk about some of our other actions. Hi folks, I'm back again um, to talk about one of our other key sum programs that we are continuing to work on during the election, which is our Repro Receipts campaign. Um, we started our Repro Receipts campaign just for some background in 2020, um, building off of years of corporate accountability campaigns, 
and success in forcing corporations to speak out about various abortion bans and restrictions happening, including in Georgia in 2019 when they passed their, at that point, um, the most restrictive abortion ban in the country, the six-week abortion ban. Um, we decided to level that up and to organize in a lane that hasn't traditionally been one that we've organized in the reproductive rights and justice sphere, which is to corporations and putting pressure on them, consumer pressure and worker pressure, for them to do better when it comes to fighting for abortion rights. Um, which means also calling out the ways in which corporate power has led us to this moment where Roe has been overturned and millions of people do not have access to, um, to abortion care. So our Repurpose Use campaign is all about collecting the data at the state and federal level for how the biggest, the Fortune 250 or the biggest 250 companies in the country um, spend their political dollars. So that is the dollars from their PAC and from their treasuries that they then use to give to various candidates or committees for public office that allows them to have some kind of sway in our political system. So in fact, corporate America played a major role in the fall of Roe, like I said. Um, the 2020 election cycle alone, the biggest corporations in this country gave over 247 million to anti-abortion lawmakers. So our goal with this campaign is to call out companies like AT&T and Comcast, who, for example, combined to give 500,000 to the politicians behind the Mississippi abortion ban that then went to the Supreme Court and overturned Roe, <laughs> the court used to overturn Roe, to call out the corporations who give those funds and draw the connections between those contributions and the legislative outcomes that they help support. And to ultimately chip away at the infrastructure and funding structure that is sustaining the anti-abortion movement. So we have done several actions on and offline. Um, offline, we are super, or online, we are super excited to um, re-up our revamped Repo Receipts website. This website is an in-depth and interactive data website um, that we launched to educate consumers um, and the media and workers alike about the role of corporate America and their political contributions in the rollback of our reproductive rights. I also want to stop and make a note here that it's not just about abortion. We really see, you know, anti-abortion views as a bellwether for a larger extremist framework. It's pretty much a guarantee that if someone's anti-abortion and running for office, you can probably go down a list of the other things that they are working to roll back, whether it's trans rights or LGBTQ rights overall, environmental justice, racial justice, they're probably down the row, fairly not great candidates to be supporting for workers or consumers alike. Um, so our website, which I'll drop in the chat as well, um, is a, just an interactive way for you to engage with our data that we then use to power our online and offline actions. Um, with your help, we've also flooded the inboxes and social media feeds of corporate executives, calling them out and drawing them directly to the impacts of the corporate giving they oversee. And then offline, we've organized at, to bring the fight directly to the doors, whether it's at the ATT headquarters in Dallas holding rallies and protests, um, or bringing, you know, having our members like you go to ATT stores around the country and talk with workers about political giving and its impacts and give demand letters demanding better from the company. Um, for the election, we're focusing on three major states for our work, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Texas. Um, these are states that either we have, we have to maintain access to, so Michigan and, and Pennsylvania, we have access to abortion care hanging on by the thread of a veto in the governor's mansion, so we want to make sure that we are keeping that um, and calling out the companies who are headquartered in those states who are working against that goal, so in Michigan. We're doing actions, including a, a, a guide that we'll be releasing soon um, that's all about the ways in which GM and Ford, our country's two largest automakers, um, give to anti-abortion folks across the country. Um, and also why we need to organize in Michigan because they have a great proactive pro-abortion ballot measure um, that is happening this November. And we need to make sure we're supporting um, pro-abortion, pro-justice candidates at the governor level, at the um, gubernatorial level, secretary of state level, and attorney general level. Um, I say this a lot, but it is very true that state politics matter a huge, huge amount. And we know that so much of the rollback of our rights begin in the states. Um, we are also working in Texas, which we know, as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a laboratory for anti-abortion policy. Um, 
policies and laws, as we saw, unfortunately, with the SB, um, with SB1 that passed in, 20, in 2021, which led to a slew of six-week bans and vigilante provisions across the country. Um, we have an opportunity to pick up a key office with the governor's race this year and to build a bulwark against anti-abortion politicians. Of note there is that, again, no state is unwinnable and the majority of Texans support abortion access. And we wanna make sure that at and which is headquartered in Texas and one of the main bad actors and anti-political and anti-choice political giving, hear that consumer voice and respond to it and stop giving to anti-abortion um, politicians across the country. Um, so again, we ask that you look at our website and look at the data, continue to look for um, updates as we update our website with new data. I'm also going to drop in our petition to Ford and GM um, calling out their political giving, and we'll be launching a Ford and GM campaign um, later this month that we'll be sending out to folks on email and on social media as well. And I'm going to pass it to our lovely Disinfo team, Bridget and Jaya. Thanks, Sonia. Hi, Bridget here again. So how can we have the critical conversations that matter to our democracy? And how can we have functional elections if our major platforms that we use to communicate are full of things like harassment, false news, uh, misleading information, and fake news? Disinformation is the intentional spread of misleading information. It differs from misinformation in that it's spread intentionally to disinform, confuse, create chaos, and distrust. Disinformation, misinformation, fake news, and online harassment are nothing new. But in recent years, they have been a recipe for the spread of harmful, misleading information on social media. In the lead up to the election, Ultraviolet has made combating harmful disinformation a priority because we know that it's critical to making our voices heard at the polls this November. I don't think I need to tell you that over the last few years, we've seen disinformation about things like COVID, the results of the election, and disinformation rooted in harmful biases around underrepresented groups. We continue to see baseless attacks on the integrity of our elections. And these attacks are meant to foster distrust in our democratic process. However, we didn't fall for it. The reality is that women, young people, and communities of color came out to vote in historic numbers despite facing barriers like voter suppression. As threats of violence proliferate against election workers, many of whom are women of color, on platforms like Facebook, and as, as the right wing ramps up racist, gender-based attacks against Black women candidates running for office, the action needed to stop hate speech and disinformation on social media is more urgent than ever. We already know the ways that disinformation can threaten our democracy. So rather than waiting around for those attacks to blossom, the UV community got organized and got prepared. One of the most powerful tools against disinformation is inoculation. Ultraviolet is working to inoculate our audience against disinformation by continuing to uplift accurate and timely resources about our election, the voting process, and the candidates running for office. The number one way that you can help curb disinformation is not to amplify it, even if you're trying to debunk it. Instead, focus on being a consistent and trustworthy source of accurate information for your own little pocket of the internet. So we spread that message far and wide. Ahead of the election, we're working with partners to train their members on what they can expect in terms of baseless attacks this election season, how to combat them, and how to act as a trusted messenger in their own communities to help drown out myths and disinformation, to help accurate information about the election and the candidates to spread. But we're also focused on creating a culture of accountability for the media, for the media platforms and the bad actors who propagate and profit off of myths and disinformation that threatens our elections and our democracy. Disinformation isn't just spread by individuals. It's also fueled by media when they repeat, repeat baseless claims in the headlines and in news stories. Candidates from underrepresented backgrounds deserve to be judged by their actions and their records, not disinformation, racism, and sexism. We created a media guide to help media outlets better report on candidates from underrepresented backgrounds fairly without fueling disinformation rooted in biases about their identity and to help hold the media accountable when they fail to do this. We know that disinformation is also fueled by social media platforms. We ran campaigns holding social media platforms accountable for their role in the spread of harmful disinformation. We trained high impact values aligned influencers on how they could harness the power of their big platforms to hold social media account platforms accountable for the harm they've caused. We're also releasing a set of demands to platforms ahead of the election to make sure that they know they will be held accountable. Black women have been coming out and running for office in historic numbers. 
But we know that supporting Black women is more than just a catchy slogan. It means also creating the conditions so that the Black women running for office can be judged by their records, words, and merits, not racist, sexist, disinformation, and attacks. It means creating the conditions for them to thrive. And I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Jaya, to tell you a bit more about how we're accomplishing that. Thanks, Bridget. Um, hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here uh, with you all. Uh, my name is Jaya Ayer. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the campaign director here at Ultraviolet working on our Women's Disinformation Defense Project and our federal disinfo policy. You can go to the next slide. So what is the Women's Disinformation Defense Project? Um, we abbreviate, uh, abbreviate it often to the WDDP, um, and it's made up of more than 30 organizations across the racial and gender justice space that have come together to fight racist and sexist disinformation. And you can see some of the organizations listed here. You can go to the next slide. So what do we mean when we say racist and sexist disinformation? Um, the way the WDDP thinks about this um, is as lies about women's health care, including the, quote, science of abortion and the impact of COVID vaccines on uh, women's and, and people's reproductive health, attacks on women of color leaders, candidates and voters, harmful narratives about trans women and girls in schools and sports, and other emergent attacks that disproportionately impact Black women, women of color, and LGBTQ folks. You can go to the next slide. The next slide. Thanks. Um, so setting the stage uh, for the 2022 midterms, which are quickly approaching, um, we're mobilizing in these four key states, and we've identified a handful of significant um, races that we've decided um, we need to actively engage in to defend women candidates. Um, these four states are Florida, Michigan, Nevada, and North Carolina, and our goal is to protect key women candidates and voters in these states from the harms of disinformation attacks and increase the turnout of women voters to vote and get these candidates elected. These four races include Val Demings' run for Senate in Florida, Governor Whitmer in Michigan, Senator um, or Governor Whitmer's reelection campaign in Michigan, Senator Catherine Cortez Masto's Senate reelection campaign in Nevada, and Sherry Beasley's campaign for U.S. Senate in North Carolina. Um, so to give you an overview of these four key states, I want to give you a sense of the narratives that um, the conservatives and the GOP are really pushing um, to actively um, hurt and spread disinformation against these key candidates um, who really pose a, an incredible opportunity for, for progressive advocates um, across the country. So in Florida with Val Demings, um, given the GOP narrative that Demings is quote, soft on crime and an abortion extremist, the WDDP is calling attention to her tangible lived experience as a former police officer, her time in Congress and her commitment to reproductive rights for all. We're working with groups on the ground to counter these racist, misogynistic attacks against Demings, who as a Black woman in public office faces threats and derogatory comments from the GOP and the media uh, more broadly. In Nevada, the WDDP is working with organizers on the ground to ensure narratives about Senator Cortez Masto are accurate and to stop the spread of racist and sexist mis and disinfo. As the only Latina senator in the country, Senator Cortez Masto offers a unique perspective that is not otherwise represented in the Senate. In North Carolina, Sherry Beasley or Judge Beasley is facing attacks by Donald Trump as he has helped campaign for her opponent, incumbent Ted Budd. Due to the recent derogatory comments made by Trump during a campaign stop for Bud, we're anticipating more hateful, racist, and sexist language against Judge Beasley to emerge from the opposition in the coming weeks. And finally, in Michigan, as many of you likely know, in 2020, Governor Whitmer was the target of an attempted kidnapping by a white supremacist organization. Now, her Republican challenger, Tudor Wick Dixon, is invoking this attempted kidnapping on the campaign trail as a cry for attention and as a joke. As partners within the WDDP, we're monitoring Dixon's campaign messaging and pushing the media to be better and more honest in its coverage. Um, and, you know, to be frank, they've been minimizing the very real threats that Governor Whitmer has faced. And we're really calling them out and calling the GOP and Republicans out for enabling comments like this. So next slide. Um, 
the thing that I want you all to know is that you can do stuff. You can join our fight against disinformation for this upcoming election, for next year, and of course for 2024, which is starting to feel uh, closer than ever in a very scary and exciting way. Uh, dangerous language and the spread of disinformation can hurt our democracy by spreading false narratives. But there are things you can do to stop the spread of disinfo and start gener generative conversations with your community, both on and offline. So I've spotlighted three images that I think really encapsulate um, what we're trying to communicate and the ways in which you can engage in this conversation. The first graphic um, shows kind of the spread of disinfo and what you can do. Um, if you see misleading content that's posted, pause, don't engage and report it. Trust your instincts. You should ask yourself, does it seem too over the top or outrageous to be true? Is it trying to make you angry? If you think something's off, you're probably right. And you should ask yourself, how are these messages and photos filtered through, um, through biases against uh, Black, Indigenous people of color, disabled, LGBTQ people, women, and other systemically oppressed groups? What emotions are these messages and photos trying to evoke? So these are just a few tools that you can use in your everyday or in conversations with your loved ones, um, but be sure to follow UV to stay up to date on our fight against disinformation. And now I'll pass it back to Sonia. Hi everyone. So thanks for your patience as we've gone through our various programs. Um, now's the time for any questions. If you have a question, go ahead and drop it into the chat function uh, and we'll make sure that we can get it to the right campaigner so they can get you the best answer. Um, so we'll give about a couple minutes for people to think of any questions they have. And if folks don't have questions, we'll wrap up and um, give everyone back 20 minutes of their time. Okay, I see uh, Ra, I hope I'm saying um, your name right. Sorry if I'm not. Um, if we see disinformation against Sherry Beasley, um, like two horrible billboards, to whom do you report it? Um, I'm going to pass that to our just info team to see if folks have any insight there from Katie or Jaya or Bridget. Yeah, that is actually a really, that's a great question. Um, I would say that when it comes to like in-person examples of disinformation, um, take a photo um, and, you know, send it to, um, to ultraviolet, send it to us. Cause I, I think getting those like real life examples is, is important. Um, and while we're really taking, um, uh, we're, we're, while we're really activating um, uh, online, um, you know, there are still really, obviously there are still moments where um, uh, you will see real life examples of disinformation like a billboard. Um, but yeah, so that's a great question and definitely Bridget, if you have any other thoughts, um, but that's good info for us to have, to know that they're horrible, uh, billboards um, against Sherry Beasley. Um, and that's good intel for us as we um, continue mobilizing um, in support of her. Um, also, we have, I don't know your name, it's under Zoom user, uh, making a comment that they never remove things. I report like saying, um, like saying derogatory things about Michelle Obama. Um, do you have any examples, Jaya or Bridget, about what to do if it doesn't seem like the, the platforms are removing things that you report? Um, yeah, it's really frustrating because it often will feel like, and a lot of times they don't remove offensive, um, racist, you know, insight, like uh, content that's inciting hate or violence. Um, and that's just another example of them failing at the task that has been assigned to them, which is to monitor and remove hateful content. I think with something like this, it's important for um, you to definitely keep reporting. Um, if you're seeing stuff that seems like extremely inflammatory, um, you can totally reach out to Ultraviolet, um, but get involved with us, like get involved with the organization, because I think um, when it comes to um, when it comes to uh, 
pushing the platforms, people power is really where it's at. Um, so, you know, sign, sign stuff, get involved. Um, yeah, mobilize, join us in mobilizing. Okay, um, trying to sort out. Sorry for the snappy with the um, chat box, folks. Um, I'm going to read out. Sorry, chat's moving a little quick. Um, from Richard, greetings to the United Kingdom. Oh, thanks for joining us, Richard. <laughs> Very late for you. Um, how can Democrats really win the midterms? Um, or how can Dems win the midterms? You know, I, I think there's it's always guesswork in these things, but what we've seen. Oh, my video is off. I'm sorry. Um, what we've seen is that there's a huge, huge uh, increase in voter turnout or voter registration for women, especially following the decision in the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health case. And so what we're doing at UV to ensure, you know, Dems have a fighting chance in November is really taking that energy from the summer, that anger, that desire to want to change things, that understanding of how things have gone and translating that directly to votes by doing the text banks and the postcards and the canvassing and other gatherings, stuff like that, to keep people engaged in this fight. Uh, there's a lot of things happening, as Shauna referenced, there's a lot of things going on in the world, um, but people understand very, um, very deeply what it means to, to lose a right. Um, and are really angry about that. And so we've known from polling and from conversations around the country, this is a huge motivating factor for voters. And we're going to keep the momentum going by continuing to engage people, um, not just on what's happening around the country, but also more importantly, the fact that there is there is hope and that we have the power to turn this, this ship around um, and to do a long work of regaining our rights and also to expand on it. Because while Roe was important, mm -hmm. it was the floor of what we need for abortion access, not the ceiling. And we have a lot of work to get to that ceiling point, um, even with Roe now being gone. Okay, any more questions from the chat box? I'm just going, sorry, going through. Um, okay, um, we are always happy to um, answer questions in our info box as well. Um, I also want to um remind folks that we'll be sending around a recording to this to anyone who registered um as well so folks will have this recording for your records or to refer back to as well um i also just want to you know if you are interested in continuing support ultraviolet's work of course action is something that we are always encouraging folks to take um but also if you want to learn more about our work please feel free to join us um on um, by texting the number in on the screen here. Um, if you want to talk about ways to give individually, institutionally to further our work for gender justice, please reach out to us at devo at weareultraviolet.org as well. Um, again, a reminder, we'll be following up this email with a recording, uh, which will include the slides as well. And we're gonna give folks back some time this evening to enjoy with their families. Thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. Thanks, Sonia.